um, the recording. And then I'd like to say a big hello to my friend, Nathan Reed, who's joining us tonight for this presentation on a year in the life of a commercial beehive or beekeeper or beekeeping. Um, I met Nathan years ago, a few years ago, when I was working at the uh, Baltimore County Ag Center. And if you haven't been to that facility, please check it out. It's great. It's open uh, every day of the year from sunrise to sunset. It's free. Just go and wander around. Um, it's in Hunt Valley off of Shawan Road. Um, and Nathan taught some beekeeping classes for us and helped to set up some beehives uh, at the Ag Center. Uh, and I was love, I love bees. It just, they just fascinate me. Um, and I was mentioning before we we're getting started and I was talking with Nathan that we, um, we don't know as much about the commercial side of beekeeping, but that's the, that's the part that keeps the food on our plates. One third of all the food that we eat comes from the power of pollination. So I'm stopping right there and I'm turning it over to the guy who knows, the bee guy. Thanks, Nathan. Thank you, Bronwyn. Um, it's great to be back. You were, uh, I, I think I migrated from CCBC over to uh, the uh, mark there. Uh, and uh, you gave me a great space and uh, we had some really good classes there. I look back on those and um, I took that and I went full head into commercial beekeeping about four years ago now. Uh, it's my primary source of income. Um, and I will just say, if you are into entomophagy, uh, I don't recommend uh, I don't recommend honeybees for specifically the swelling purposes. Um, okay, so let me screen share here, and um, I will see what I can get to because I want to answer everybody's uh, questions. Um, but I am going to sort of stay in line with what we had talked about um, as far as this being. Uh, a year in the life of a commercial beekeeper. Um, consequently, a year in the life of a commercial hive. Uh, but we won't be able to uh, really delve into every little aspect of beekeeping. However, we're gonna hang on there towards the end. If you do have some burning questions, uh, throw that in the chat and uh, Brahmin will uh, stop me there. Um, I chose this picture here. This is actually in Washington state, just south of the Canadian border by about uh, 15 miles. You're looking at Mount Baker there. Uh, so when Bronwyn asked me for a picture to sort of encapsulate it all, um, I really thought that was, uh, that was a good one there. Um, so uh, we're moving into managed pollinators. What is a managed pollinator? Well, it's managed pollinator is something that, uh, it's a pollinator that uh, is managed much like you would a farm animal, um, but it's insect farming. Uh, there are other managed pollinators out there. Um, bumblebees for one, um, and you will see uh, little nests of bumblebees put out in blueberry crops and things like that. But today we're talking about honeybees and why are we talking about honeybees? Um, because they make up the majority of the necessary pollination um, in the US today, really all over uh, in Canada and everywhere else uh, in the world where uh, pollination is needed, um, it's honeybees that are managed. It's um, well over a hundred crops, but right off the top, uh, things that you're gonna recognize right away, blueberries, raspberries, watermelons, almonds, um, apples, uh, the list goes on and on, cherries. Um, but uh, the European honeybee, um, which is what we just know as the common honeybee, really, um, is the most efficient at what she does. And it is a she. Every time you see a honeybee out there, there's a picture of a honeybee. Uh, is a female. They are the workers of the hive. Um, so let's just get right into sort of what are we talking about when we talk about commercial beekeeping? Uh, we're looking at beekeepers with uh, 500 plus hives. Uh, typically, they will move the colonies to locations that can uh, support their herd, if you will, uh, with enough forage. Uh, sometimes that forage is a managed orchard. Other times it's just uh, natural uh, flora, you know, stuff that's out there. Uh, it's already blooming and um, they're not being paid to be there, uh, but the bees are benefiting from what's out there. Things we call weeds, clovers, white clover, autumn olive, um, 
you know, these are all things that uh, support the bees uh, throughout their life cycle of the season. Um, and uh, some areas do better than others uh, for lots of different reasons. But uh, Bronwyn had mentioned earlier, uh, you know, why don't orchards get involved in keeping their own bees and sort of save the cost? And a big reason to that is um, that area is only good for so long. And we'll get into that um, a little bit more down the line. Um, and as far as the commercial industry goes, there's uh, a couple of different ways to make money. Um, the first we're gonna talk about is pollination services. That's where uh, the farmer pays uh, me, the beekeeper, to bring my hives uh, into the orchard while things are blooming in order to cross pollinate, get fertilization and get a crop. Um, there's also honey production, uh, which is pretty straightforward. Um, colony production, which is the business of building uh, new beehives and uh, selling them. Uh, there's also queen production. Um, every hive has a queen bee and that queen bee is valuable in a lot of ways. And we'll also delve a little bit more into that. Um, and then there's equipment manufacturing, which is more of a niche thing. And uh, some of the bigger players have pretty well dominated that, but um, there's some odds and ends to it. Um, so uh, the farmers are gonna pay so many dollars per hive and it's placed into the orchard while it's blooming. Um, and then that pollination money is uh, variable depending on the value of the crop and almonds pay the most. And that's where we're gonna see a big portion of uh, the beekeeper's income come from. Almost, I wanna say 80 or about 80% 80 of the managed pollinators in this country go to almonds every year. Um, now the honey that's made during pollination contracts is left for the beekeeper uh, to keep, but typically we don't see them um, build up as, as much on the almonds. What we will see them do is uh, blueberries and raspberries, things like that. But the, the best honey making yards in the country are in places like the Dakotas. And it's just pastures of canola um, and uh, Dutch white clover, yellow clover, things like that. Um, so there's a couple of different ways to make uh, money in the beekeeping industry. Now, what you see here is a backyard setup. Uh, this yard actually belonged to the former president of the Central Maryland Beekeepers Association, which is where I got my start and uh, what Bronwyn and I uh, sort of worked together to put hives um, up at the mark. Um, but here you see a standard, more or less standard, he has some fancy equipment there, but um, this is what a backyard uh, apiary looks like. You have hives on individual stands and they're not gonna move locations. And the reason that's important is that whatever is around that apiary is all they have for the whole year. And in Maryland, our seasons can be just, just so finicky. So they, um, they come, uh, the, the spring comes on and your bees need to be healthy and they need to be able to capitalize. And you're hoping you don't get too much rain to wash out something like the black locust, which is a really delicate bloom and all the nectar washes out, but these bees are staying put. So that means they have three to four months, maybe five if it's a good year, to prepare themselves for the rest of the year, for the cold winter, for the dearth and the summer. Um, and that's a backyard beekeeper. Now, what you'll see with a commercial beekeeper is that the hives are palletized. They're ready to move with a forklift and uh, the bees will be moved based on the next uh, flow. Um, if there's a uh, automata flow or if there's a new pollination contract or something like that, the point being is that they don't stay in the same location um, the entire year. They're able to move and that's what makes them valuable. Um, it's also what adds a lot of extra cost to the whole process between shipping and uh, replacing queens and everything else. Um, but what you'll see on the right side of your screen are your standard four-way pallet. Um, the bees, the, the colony sits on the pallet much like it would uh, in the backyard uh, beekeeper setup, but they're really close together and they're able to be stacked and shipped. So where do the hives go? 
during pollination contracts, the hives are actually just going to be placed right in the orchards. Um, and they're typically done at night, so um, the bees aren't flying while they're actually being moved. But uh, because they are palletized, they can be picked up with a forklift, they can be put on the back of a truck, and they can be moved into an orchard. Um, and to actually see this, um, once you see it, you feel like it, you take a picture, they kind of all look the same, but really in there um, at night in the moment, um, what you see on the left hand side here is uh, a whole bunch of highs being loaded on the back of a semi truck. Um, and the sort of the dark spots you see, um, those are bees hanging out in the front entrance. Um, because one thing bees do really well is they generate heat. So if you were to take a thermal camera and look at that semi load, you would see a lot of heat right there. Um, but the, the wind from the truck driving down the road keeps them um, cool enough and honeybees are masters at regulating temperature and the environment inside their hive. Um, so then what you see on the right hand side is after they drop the net, uh, they throw a bunch of straps on it and then it goes down the road just like that. Um, certain times of the year in certain corridors, you can see lots of trucks coming and going. Um, and you can tell sometimes by the writing on the net whose bees they are, um, but those are bees. Um, and so they keep the net on there so the, the bees don't fly out during daylight hours um, because the trip isn't always short. Sometimes it's much longer. Um, and we're gonna get to some pretty cool videos I have embedded in the file here. Um, just hang with me because I have some pretty neat stuff to show you. Um, but realistically, the, the way I decided to break this down was uh, the start of the season is almond pollination. And that happens late January to mid-March. It's all in California and it's all in the valley. Um, north to south, it stretches pretty far down and pretty far up uh, the California Valley. Now this pollination pays more than any other pollination out there. And we'll go through a little breakdown of how that works, but it's also a really good pollen uh, for the bees to work. Um, the, the crude protein level's really high um, and it comes at a time when there's not too much else uh, blooming in the US to benefit the bees. So uh, almond pollination really kind of hits on two fronts. One, it's great for revenue. Uh, money coming in. Two, it's good for the bees to build them up and set yourself up later in the year. Um, so what you see here is uh, your typical sort of almond orchard. Um, you'll typically cap the ends of the rows of the almonds with the pallets of bees there and they just go right in and really they're there for about six to eight weeks and depending on what your operation does, uh, you can be the guy who sends his bees off and sends it off to a broker and then you get, you know, four or five weeks of time off where you might, you might actually take your vacation. That's the one time of the year that uh, beekeepers will take a vacation or they will go down and um, they'll be the ones on the ground who are unloading these semis in the middle of the night. Um, a lot of different orchards there. I'll tell you, they don't all have grass like the one on the left hand picture and uh, if it rains, it's just, it's slicker than all heck. And you, you grow about three inches just walking um, out of your truck there. Um, and so what we see here is kind of uh, the moves or, or the routes that uh, beekeepers will take. Um, so depending on where you are, um, sort of depends on, on what you do for where you wanna go and um, what time of the year you're gonna be moving and things like that. Uh, me personally, I was in uh, Michigan and we would come down to Florida. And then when it got time for almonds, we would go over to California. And once almonds are done, you come back to California and you hang out in Florida until about early May when it's warm enough to go up to Michigan for the apples. Um, so it's, a you're always on the move. That's, that's one thing for sure. Uh, but depending on where your home base is, the cost and everything uh, to this and how you manage your bees um, is really variable. Um, and certain crops uh, 
you know, I, I mentioned how uh, beneficial the almonds were, um, but what they look into is how certain crops like blueberries, uh, they have to spray fungicides all the time. And those fungicides, um, whether alone or mixed with other, um, with other chemicals have a synergistic effect that really comes in and it's just, it's, it's detrimental to the hives. It's really tough. Um, it's almost like trading short-term gains for long-term losses. Um, and just like farming, each season's a little bit different. Um, but this is the route uh, a lot of people will take. Um, and it's, it's not cheap. Um, and I wanted to get into that a little bit. But um, so this is the breakdown of the route I would take would be uh, Florida to California at the beginning of the year, start the almond season, um, come back from Florida and, or come back from California. And uh, we're not, we're working off of uh, Spanish needle and low bush and high bush gallberry um, and tai tai and saw palmetto. Um, when it really affects your work, you start to understand what's blooming and what's not. Um, and that's been a real treat getting to know that because these were uh, sort of flows. This was a, a dynamic that I just wasn't aware of until I was forced to pay attention to it. Um, go up to uh, Florida or from Florida to Michigan for the honey season and then Michigan back down to Florida um, to sort of recoup any losses in the hives. Uh, hives not guaranteed to stay alive. So you're constantly sort of building back your numbers, building back your herd. Um, really what a lot of people aren't aware of is uh, shipping. So one of the hidden costs to doing a commercial beekeeping uh, is how expensive it is to move uh, the hives. Um, if you're looking at something like a standard freight uh, that maybe leaves a, a box store, they're making 80 cents to a dollar a mile. Um, but shipping hive stock, livestock like honeybees uh, can be upwards of $3 a mile, uh, which is really expensive. Um, so that's why you have to get uh, as many hives on the truck as possible. Um, if you're looking at like the route I was taking from Florida to California, it's almost 3,000 miles one way. Um, that's an $18,000 round trip. Um, and if we're looking at a typical semi, you're getting 432 hives on there. Let's say an average of $180 per uh, hive is what the almond uh, farmer might be paying you. Um, you look at the revenue there and you're out 30% just based on uh, shipping cost. Um, not included in that was everything it took to get the hives ready uh, to actually get to California. Um, there's a lot of different factors that come into that. If I was uh, to, to get $180 worth of revenue, I'd have to make $90 worth of, um, or 90 pounds worth of honey at $2 a pound um, and even that's favorable. Um, every scenario, it, you know, it, it all plays out a little bit differently. And um, as a beekeeper, you have to figure out what works the best for you. This isn't a ubiquitous end all be all the only way to do it. Um, but these are the sort of decisions that uh, beekeepers are making. Um, and that's assuming everything goes as planned. So this is a really, uh, Rama, we were talking about how Steve was talking about the darker side of beekeeping a little bit. Um, this was a semi truck that went from um, Florida to California. Um, it got stopped once or twice and it got inspected at the border. Um, it went through Texas, which is hot. Uh, what you're looking at is three to four inches of dead bees. Um, this is just, I mean, this is the worst I've ever seen it. Um, you wouldn't see it this bad. Uh, but you know, you're making all these decisions and you're just assuming everything goes right. And what I see when I look at this is how much work it took to get those hives strong enough to make it across uh, the country. And then to have something like getting stalled at the California Ag Station border, um, getting turned around, having to stand still and he, he can't drive um, and he can't get wind on the bees and they, they cook, they overheat. Um, a couple of you might have even seen a, a semi-trailer, I think made the news a couple of years ago of overturning on the highway. 
uh, it's chaos. You just can't come back from it. Um, these hives did end up making it okay, but um, you know, it's setbacks like this that are very, uh, it's part of the job. Um, hey, Nathan, um, Kathy had a, had a question that kind of flew into that. Um, what do the bees do if it, if it does take several days? I mean, I guess some of them die, um, but do they stay in the hive? I guess, does the net keep them in the hives or? The net keeps them on the truck, um, but you, what you will see is the, um, so you see how they're stacked from, you know, several stories up. Um, a lot of times what you'll see is the bottom hive, the bees crawl up to the top hives. And then the combination of having the 55 mile an hour winds against them, bees tend to get blown towards the back. Um, so if you look at it, it's kind of the top layer gets the bulk of the bees that were old enough to, let's say the day before they're going out and foraging. And the, you know, it's warm enough, the lights, you know, the sun's out, but they really can't go anywhere. They will still come out of the hive to some extent. And what they tend to do is crawl up and then get blown back. Um, and I've, I've done personal tests where I can say, um, I take the top layer off and the back layer off and I kind of keep them separate um, when I go to place them in uh, yards for making honey. And those tend to be the stronger highs, whereas the ones at the front and at the bottom are a little bit weaker. But ultimately, it's just, it's a built-in loss. Um, it's a built-in shrinkage that commercial beekeepers just have to deal with. Um, I hope that answered that. Uh, so I'll, let's get to some of these videos here. Um, but basically once the pollination's over, the hives go back on to the truck and depending on your scenario or whatever your apiary is running, um, you go to the next crop uh, for pollination or maybe you go back to do something else like making bees. Um, here you see my buddy Ben, actually moving bees at night isn't, uh, it's kind of one of the calmer things I get to do. Uh, the weather's cool, uh, the bees don't fly towards the yellow and the red lights as much. And you'll see Ben here, he doesn't have any PPE on. Uh, he's just in his boots and his jacket, working the forklift. Um, and it is, uh, relatively speaking, it's, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty nice process when it's, uh, when it's simple like that. Um, other times, bees can, uh, moving bees can last till sunrise. I, I remember taking this picture in the panhandle uh, of Florida and the, we just, we moved bees all night and the sun was coming up and we were in a pine tree farm. Um, and this was an area that just had recently been cleared, but you get to see a lot of fantastic views um, doing this job. Um, but one thing's for sure is you're always moving. You're always hitting the road and you're only as good as the equipment you have. Um, here, you know, it's, it's a truck, a trailer and a forklift and that's the workhorse. Um, and it's gotta be able to handle the logistics of, of everything you're doing with it. Um, I'll do a shameless plug here. Uh, on our cross country trips, I did get to see the Grand Canyon and Moab, uh, the Moab Desert Arches National Park. So uh, it's really important to take those times to sort of step off and uh, smell the roses because when the truck shows up late at night, um, you have to be there. And if the bees need to be attended to on a Saturday or a Sunday, uh, they're really not beholden to any sort of schedule. Um, now, after almond pollination, what we see is, um, that's the summer months, that's the spring and summer months, that's the honey making months. And you see these yellow states here are where most of the hives in the country uh, reside after that fact. We see uh, California, uh, the Dakotas, Michigan, um, Florida does because a lot of beekeepers stay in Florida year round just because um, they don't have to ship uh, because it is, it is warm enough to stay there. And there are, uh, there's plenty blooming in Florida, let me tell you that. Um, but uh, this is uh, my trip to Michigan. Um, we had a whole shop built up there. And what you see in the bottom right hand is where we would store all the comb. So we had five or 6,000 hives and uh, they require a lot of boxes. And um, a big part of commercial beekeeping is comb management, taking care of everything and uh, making sure it doesn't get damaged by uh, uh, other pests. 
Um, but a lot of the time when you're not at home base, uh, you're forced to operate out of your um, truck. So the time comes for making honey. Uh, we get up to Michigan and you're gonna spread the hives around in different locations. I think I had approximately 120 different landowners. Uh, we would spread 30 to 40 uh, hives per location. And um, that's really just done with uh, landowners in a sort of a handshake agreement. At the end of the uh, summer, they get, um, they get uh, a couple of jars of honey and it, everything works out. Um, but once the bees get out of pollination and they get up to Michigan, it's time for them to make honey and you got to get boxes on right away. So as soon as they hit the ground, that's what they're doing. Um, when they are placed, what's going to happen is um, they're going to get boxes put on and it's the beekeeper's job to sort of inspect them every three weeks. And what we see on average is one beekeeper is taking care of about 650 to 800 hives. So the amount of time they spend in those hives is very minimal. Um, it's very much a cut and run sort of quick inspection. If it looks okay, then you move on. If not, then you spend a little bit more time on it. Um, you got to worry about disease and pests and um, if your queen is failing, uh, most queens only last about nine months um, under good scenarios. Um, and uh, you got to keep that queen alive because she's everything. Sometimes um, it's just nature that you have to worry about. Um, I remember this tree fell down and we came back uh, two and a half weeks later and some of those hives were doing just fine. But, uh, you know, that was a good day and a half of cutting up with a chainsaw, moving with the forklift, taking out the bad equipment, figuring out uh, which hives were still alive. Um, this was really interesting. This is a hay bale that rolled down the hill and just narrowly uh, went in between my pallets of bees here. Um, and if you can see on this one, uh, if you see my cursor here, there's just a ton of bees on that hive. You see them up front here too. I was late in getting extra boxes on these and this is what happens. I mean, they're just, uh, they're, they're hanging outside on the front. They're probably getting ready to swarm, but um, anything can happen. Um, other times it's bears um, and bears actually don't want honey. What they want is uh, they want something to eat and the, the brood uh, provides a lot of protein for them with that. Um, so I won't get too deep into this, but um, as far as hive management, what the what the commercial guy is doing, he's he's always taking care of the hive and he's making sure it's healthy. The varroa mite is our biggest problem. Keeping queens fresh is um, another problem because um, they only last so long. Um, building comb and a small hive beetle um, that tends to move in on weaker hives. So you're always trying to keep your herd numbers up and you're always trying to um, sort of keep things healthy and there's a lot of stuff attacking you. Um, what you see on the right-hand side here, those little things that kind of look like poppy seeds, uh, that's a varroa mite. And uh, what we would do is we'd put this note card um, in, the, in the hive on the bottom board and uh, the bees walk on the grease and they groom themselves and then the mite falls down. Um, and it's, uh, we give them about three rounds um, I'm glazing over this topic a little bit, I'll be honest, but uh, I can't understate how important it is to keep on top of that. You have other factors like chalk brood. This is when a queen lays an egg and uh, it turns to stone before it ever actually becomes a new bee. It's very labor intensive um, for the bees to kind of keep feeding larvae that don't become new nurse bees. Um, and that's when small hive beetle moves in. Um, You'll see here uh, just these little larvae um, that really just thrive um, when there's all these, uh, a hive gets robbed out or it's weak or something like that. Um, it's not the most fun thing to watch, but this is a huge part of commercial beekeeping. People don't talk about the smell of a terribly infested um, frame. Um, what you see on the right-hand side is uh, a box that got left in a honey house before it got extracted and that larva started to propagate and get really nasty. Um, on the left-hand side, well, that was my coworker, Edder. Um, 
you'll see uh, a pollen patty that has a Swiffer, uh, a piece of a Swiffer cloth. And what happens is these adult beetles get trapped on the Swiffer trying to attack and eat the pollen. Um, and the bees really don't have a natural defense against this. Um, so that's one of the things why it's really frustrating. When we talk about requeening, um, we get these queens in the mail from a company that does uh, specializes in rearing their own queens. Um, and the video on the right hand side here, uh, you'll see they have a little blue dot the queen does on the back. And this is um, the reason I sh I'm showing this is because every night what I would have to do is water my queens. They get a little drop of water and you touch it to the screen um, and you keep them alive that way. Not too much water, but um, they're in the cage with several other attendants. Um, and in the bottom picture there is, you see how they can be shipped during the mail. Um, but it's a, um, it's a it's a constant thing that you're having to go to FedEx and uh, pick up queens and they're about $20 a piece, so it's not cheap um, and taking care of those. Um, all right, so where are we at now in the season of a beekeeper? Okay, I'm okay on time, I think. Uh, the hives have moved into their summer locations. Let's say you got a queen in there. Uh, it's time to harvest some honey, right? Because uh, that's what we're, you know, that's the other half of the revenue. If you're like most beekeepers, maybe you go out to almonds, but the other half of the year you make honey. Um, so depending on which size box you choose, a full box can be 30 up to 80 pounds. Um, and then what they use is a, a organic acid uh, that they spray onto a piece of felt and they put it on top of the hive and they just cock it to the left a little bit and the bees escape because it smells stinky. It's, it's not fun work. Uh, it's long days and it, it's backbreaking. Um, on the left here, and let's see if this works. On the left here, you'll see uh, me and my dad harvesting honey in our own backyard. Um, on the right is a video, I, I, I didn't have a good one. Um, I, I pulled this from YouTube, but uh, this is just what it looks like. Um, you see there the boxes, uh, the frames being deboxed and they try to minimize handling each frame individually. Um, and it gets uncapped and it goes into a barrel spinner. And um, this is, you know, and this is a sideline uh, beekeeper. This is, I, they're commercial by all means, but um, there's lines that are much bigger than this. In the background, you see a forklift moving a, a barrel, um, 55 gallon drums worth of honey. Um, and he's gonna load this in and he's gonna spin the barrel and then they're gonna put those frames, uh, those empty frames back in a box and uh, that's honey season. Um, hey, it's Nathan. really intense. Nathan, if the honey that's produced like this, um, is it sold to food manufacturers for, for products? Um, it, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm imagining it's not put in little bottles and sold as raw honey to people or, or maybe it is. It, de it depends on the crop, um, but yes, a lot of times it will get um, passed on to a honey packager. So a honey packager will buy um, crops from several different beekeepers and uh, they will package it and bottle it based on maybe what the bees were pollinating. They might just call it wildflower, they might call it blueberry um, or, you know, Pacific Northwest or, um, the Northeast, something like that. Um, chances are they probably keep a couple of bottles, uh, a couple of barrels for themselves uh, to bottle individually, but it just takes so much time to sell those bottles individually and go to the farmer's market because they're only getting about $2 a pound. And that's a good, even then that's a good price. Um, but there's just, there's just no way to do it the way you see me and my dad doing it on the left and scale it up. Um, so this is what, this is what happens. Um, and then the honey packager, what they'll do is they'll run it, typically they'll heat it up and they'll run it through a really high micron filter and, um, and they'll filter out all the particulates. It could still be raw though. Uh, it all depends on the white label, so to speak. Um, here you see a hot room on the left. Uh, this is where me and my buddy were putting our hives. Um, and sometimes 
all the bees don't get out of the uh, boxes. And when you put a ton of them in there, they start to pile up on the windows and that's what you're seeing. Um, and on the right, we're letting them out of the, uh, out of the honey house. Um, they see that light and they wanna go. So it's about 55 gallon drums and they hold about 645 pounds. And I think I just talked about this, but um, yeah. So that's why we see such a big jump in price uh, when it gets to the farmer's market or something like that is uh, that beekeeper could be out there being a lot more efficient with his or her time um, than if they weren't standing at the table selling honey or they'd have to pay somebody to do it. It's just economies of scale. It's just easier to, um, uh, bulk sell. But we're getting down to the end of the season here. Okay, so we've uh, harvested the honey. Um, and now the queen is starting to uh, slow down. She's laying less eggs. The hive, the cluster itself is shrinking. Okay. Um, but we haven't been able to treat for varroa mites or anything else that might um, affect the honey. Uh, so once the honey's pulled off, now it's time to treat. So we treat for the varroa mites and we inspect for uh, pathogens like European fowl brood and all that stuff that's had time to sort of go unchecked uh, throughout the uh, flow. Um, and then, you know, the days get shorter and the weather gets cooler. So um, it's time to pack up and head south. Um, and the reason we do that, we pack up and we head south. Now, Canadians, um, a lot of times they won't do that because they can't go across the border. So they will put their hives into cold storage. They also don't transport their hives around as much. Um, and the varroa levels, the, the hives tend to be a little bit healthier. But what we're seeing is really big losses over winter time because the hives aren't healthy enough going into winter. So what happens is um, a weak hive that goes into winter won't make it out. Even a strong hive will go through and maybe it comes out on the other end uh, but it misses out on ability to go to almonds or an, another early pollination. So we go, uh, we pack up and we head south and that's where, you know, you have to put everything on the back of your truck um, and do that. But uh, this was taken, I think 2017, it was 34 degrees out and we snowing and we were moving honeybees uh, and I was just having a blast. Um, but we went from that to, uh, sunny and uh, 75 and we're loading it out. So that change alone uh, really sort of invigorates the queen. Uh, the days are longer than they were up north. It's a bit warmer. Um, and all of a sudden we start that cycle over again and now she's coming up. Um, so we have uh, the yards are consolidated and they're in uh, bigger drops as opposed to what they were doing up in Michigan uh, when they were out there to make honey because down here, what we do is uh, we feed them. Now, one big thing that you nobody really talks about is fire ants. Um, it, it, there are just, they're so gnarly. Um, if you've never been bitten by a fire ant, it's just, it's awful. Um, and they build up so quickly. And if you have a, uh, if they find fire ants on your truck at the border, they will uh, turn you around at the border to California. Uh, they'll turn you around and you have to go get your truck washed. And that was uh, something like that will kill a bunch of bees. So it becomes this big thing where you have to constantly stay on top of um, the fire ants. One thing to do is to staple some plastic to the ground and uh, keep new nests from coming up that way. Um, Another thing to do is uh, swap over pallets, uh, fresh pallets where there's no ants and they're sitting on top of gravel. Um, uh, and then in the background here, you see all these other pallets that we would clean and swap them over, but you get this big loading yard. It's just crazy. There's bees flying everywhere and it's nothing you would recommend anybody to do with your hive, but it's a, a cost benefit that's that's all commercial beekeeping is, is just weighing the cost versus the benefit. And it's better to get through the border on a clean uh, bill of health and swap over your pallets and maybe make some chaos um, than it is. Uh, how are we doing on time? Um, okay, um, well, this is a uh, bulk feeding. This is how uh, 
I'm doing it in Florida right now. What you see here are kiddie pools filled with wheat straw and uh, pine needles. And you have some palmetto leaves on top. And basically what happens is the, uh, the bees will come and drink from the kiddie pool and the tarp is to keep the rainwater out. Um, it's not as efficient, it's a little chaotic, but I can feed a lot of bees at one time. Whereas the alternative is to put a frame feeder in your hive, just like what you see here. And Nathan, Nathan, that's sugar water in there then. Sugar water, either sucrose or fructose. They act to both of them a little bit differently. But um, you'll see this ladder here, the bees kind of walk down this ladder for, to wherever the line is for how much syrup's in there. Um, and uh, they get fed that way. But we're, we're feeding them because there's nothing else blooming. We're not gonna pull any honey off for about five months. So they're gonna use up everything they have uh, before then. And when it's time to make honey, we put fresh boxes on. So that takes us to the end of the, the round. We're back down there in Florida. Um, this is me having fun in the almond orchards during petal fall and um, Basically, you're just, you're down in Florida, you're trying to build back your numbers and you start the year all over again and you go out to California. Um, so uh, that that is the 12 month timeline. Um, I do have some, you know, this is a scenario where my buddy, we, we saw a swarm and um, swarms are pretty docile and he's a he's an old hand as far as beekeeping goes and he just did it with his bare hands. Um, pretty crazy stuff. Um, but, um, and actually here, here's a, another really big swarm that I, uh, this was down in Florida uh, right before, um, what were we doing? It's before oranges. These are grapefruit trees. Um, and so it's, it's little moments like these that really make it kind of fun and um, make you realize it's not your not your typical nine to five. Yeah, anybody sees a swarm of honeybees in, in in and around the Baltimore area, let me know and I'll come take them. I'll come take them for you. It's no no big problem for me. <laughs> I'd love them. Well, thank Nathan, that was fabulous. I mean, I feel like we've gone all over the country. We've gone through all yeah. the seasons. We've 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 I've, we've learned so much. Does anybody have any questions? Here we see a, a new queen, virgin queen emerging. That's what's happening there in the center uh, photo there. Um, it's really stuff that you just can't, uh, it's it's fun to watch and it's even more fun to- If somebody watch. wanted, how would you suggest somebody gets involved with um, commercial? With commercial beekeeping? Um, I'd say do it in, you know, do it in your backyard for a little bit. Um, try, you know, I went from 20 hives to about 3,000 hives in just under a couple of months. Um, but I did have some, I had a, about a decade's worth of seasons. Uh, you know, I wasn't working the bees all year, but um, it's something where you, you got to get started with at least the backyard hives or somebody else's hives. Um, but uh, they're always looking for help. Um, but if you don't have experience as a beekeeper and you want to go commercial beekeeping, you're going to be doing, you're going to be doing the bottom of the rung stuff first. You're going to be feeding and um, you're not going to be in the bees so much. You're just going to be helping out. But, uh, you know, for me, it was great. It was a great, you know, I went from a mortgage loan officer to a full-time commercial beekeeper and uh, haven't looked back yet. Um, Peggy's interested to know, how do you convince the bees to stay away from a swimming pool and go hang out at a bird bath instead. Do you have any ideas on that? Uh, they love the chlorine. They love the chlorine. Um, what I uh, heard from um, Dr. Megan Milbrath at uh, Michigan State University, um, she would uh, tell me that the most risky trip for a bee to make is to go out and get water for the rest of the hive uh, because it's not gonna put any food back in their stomach. Um, so they have to take that risk of being able to forage and uh, come back without any additional input, without any carbohydrate source. So they will go somewhere that is consistent. What's consistent? A pool. Um, 
and they like the pool, I'm told because of the chlorine. Um, I've tried and put out buckets of uh, water with Epsom salt in it, and you put some sticks and other things like that that float so the bees can be in there. Um, but I guess it would just be to try and establish a reliable source early on, maybe before the pool season gets opened up, uh, away from your pool. And if they get latched onto that first, that's your best case scenario. Uh, but you're just going to have to try and bait them away from the away from the pool. It's 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 tough. I've got I've lost bee yards over it because. Would you put, would you put a little bit of when you say bait it? Would you put a little bit of caro syrup in it or something or? You don't want to make it a syrup thing because then it's nectar and it's not water. The bees that are hitting the pool are specifically water bees, and they're going back to bring water to the hive and they share it with um, they share it with the rest of the hive. Um, it's a small contingent, um, but it's 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 tough to get them not to to do that. So if you were to supply like a bird bath with a fountain and, and it it was you know, maybe it had a little bit of chlorine in it or something. I'm not saying, you know, hit it hard, but they love that, um, they love that pool water. So you could just try and create the same thing and put it off to the side, maybe look and see where the bees are coming from. If it's, uh, if you can move it closer to the direction you see the bees flying off, maybe they land on that first. Okay. Um, Mark wants to know if, if the bees don't have boxes for hives, where do the hives occur naturally? Uh, so we don't have, so like a log cavity, um, uh, a tree branch falls off and um, a tree branch falls off and uh, creates a, a nest in a, in a large tree. Uh, I'm gonna stop my sharing here. Oh, did I lose you? No, you're good. Okay. Get out of that. Um, Cause I don't see anybody. We see you, Nathan. Okay. All right. I'm just gonna keep talking. Um, so uh, yeah, they will occur in a tree cavity and uh, or something like that. But a, a lot of times, what we don't see is we don't see hives over winter. Uh, very well outside. Now, if it's a more tropical climate, um, that's something that we could do and the bees would hang out on a tree branch and maybe they make it, um, there we go, maybe they would make it through, but the, the winters are so tough. So um, you, you know where you see a lot of uh, bees take up resident is in uh, the soffit of the house um, on the outside or underneath a, a porch, or I had to, um, I had to remove like four swarms from this Amish man's house because they just kept coming out and landing on the same tree. The inside of his bedroom must have just been floor to ceiling honeycomb. It's insulated during the winter. They do great, and um, you know there's not there's no bears or raccoons coming up there. Um, so it's uh, but you you really don't see that many natural cav that many naturally occurring beehives out. Um, in the in the northern United States. Now that's contested to some degree, but um, it's just it, they're fewer and far between. Is that because they're just not a native species, or, or they aren't a native species? But it's fair to say that they've adapted, um, and this environment is conducive to them. Um, you know, chickens weren't native everywhere, but we were able to propagate and move them around. So I don't. I don't harp on that too much, um, but I mean, it is something to, to speak on, but I mean, the natural bee, uh, there was no natural honeybee population beforehand. Uh, we brought everything over here. Sure, some of them absconded and swarmed and went out there and lived just fine, um, but the days of, you know, the days of honeycomb hanging on a tree branch and making it through the winter is just, no. They're not going to do that. Not with everything else they have on top of it. Varroa mites, uh, and that's a vector for deformed wing virus, uh, just parasitic mite syndrome. Uh, it's a vector for a lot of different things. Um, so that makes it all the more tougher. And How often do you get stung? Oh, I love this question. Uh, <laughs> I stopped keeping track 
Um, you build up an immunity to it. Uh, you trade off uh, in, in warmer temperatures. Um, it's a lot, you're a lot hotter with all your uh, protective gear on. So you might trade off and say, well, I wanna be more comfortable and I can handle a couple more stings per day. Um, it could be anywhere from one to 15 times a day, depending on how the bees were responding and how careful I was being. Um, I'm sure I'm over 10,000 at this point. But the, you know, honeybees are gentle herbivores. They don't want to sting. They don't want to. I, sometimes I force their hand. I mean, they will, you know, if you step on one or yeah, I, I, the worst, the worst sting is early in the morning when there's a bee in the truck that you didn't realize and you go to reach for your bag and it just, you just touch it the right way and it stings you. I mean, it's just stuff like that happens. Um, but um, I, I have a guy that doesn't wear, he wears his veil maybe 20% of the time. Other than that, he just kind of takes it on the elbow or the wrist whenever it happens and rolls with it. Do you need any formal education to get into beekeeping? Mm -mm. No, you don't need any formal education. I think um, I would encourage everyone that wants to get involved, don't make your first step because we all get pent up in the winter. And what we want to do is order a bunch of stuff and make a whole bunch of plans. And what happens is um, a bees show up on your doorstep, equipment shows up on your doorstep and you just get flooded and you, you start doing research and everybody's certain that their way is the best way. I, just give yourself a summer, find someone else who has some hives. Uh, the Central Maryland Beekeepers Association does exactly that. Um, I think it's still up and running. Um, and uh, they let you go up there every two weeks, but find somebody else who has some hives um, and don't take that mentorship lightly. Don't take it for granted because um, chances are if they're willing to take you on, they've answered all the questions you're gonna ask them the first time. What they wanna see is, th they've already answered those questions before is what I'm saying. Uh, what they wanna see is your general interest in it and your ability to uh, go and do the homework and kind of come back and ask informed questions. Um, but uh, many a time I've seen beekeepers just, my dad included, he orders more hives than he, he can deal with. Uh, he does that during the winter months and then it shows up and for the first, you know, for spring he's fine, but time gets to summer and it's just too hot and people don't want to go out there and do it. I, I just, I've seen it so much. Um, yeah, and, and I, I, I keep a couple of, of hives or try to, so most of the time they die, but <laughs> fingers crossed. Um, but they, I highly recommend taking a class and there, the, there are different organizations that offer classes throughout the state. And if you're not in Maryland, um, throughout other states, just look at your, for your local beekeeping organization and they'll list a lot of classes um, that you can take. And, and that's a great place to start. And, and some of the, um, the ag-based universities, Penn State, um, I believe has some has some stuff online um, and through their um, uh, through their ag ag extension. Uh, Maryland might even have something. Um, and, and the Bee Informed Partnerships a really good program. Uh, and they're based out of University of Maryland, and they're doing some really interesting work with uh, citizen scientists and Sentinel Hives and, and stuff like that. So um, there's plenty of ways to sort of uh, reach out and get involved. Um, you know, I'm, I, I don't. I don't mean to say wait until uh, springtime when it's warm enough to get outside to, you know, to get a look into it. You definitely want to take a class. I just, um, I caution, make sure you can handle the sting or you're willing to suit up and go out there in hot and humid weather um, to take care of your hives before you go sort of all in. Peggy says the College of Southern Maryland has a beekeeping class on Zoom starting in February. So there you go. Everybody can get involved. Is the is the industry is the um, uh, commercial beekeeping is it is it growing is it shrinking is it being impacted by colony collapse are people getting out of it or? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I, man, it's a little bit of both. Um, there are younger guys getting into it, um, and uh, I, I mean that it, it's mostly a male dominated thing. But I've had um, I've worked. Um, I've, I've worked with women who have been great beekeepers, but it, it is an old man's game. It's kind of like you were saying, um, it used to be a gentleman's club. Um, 
this was a, it, this, and it's not, I'm tripping up over my words here. That's okay. It's, it deepens for everyone, but it's, it's farming and it's, um, it's male dominated. It's, that's just the fact of it. And there's, uh, these older beekeepers are retiring out. Um, and you have new beekeepers coming in, but you also have uh, these older beekeepers sort of selling out and uh, maybe everybody going under one umbrella, um, you know, sort of getting gobbled up. Um, it, and so it is, it, it's tough. It's, it has to grow. I mean, we're, we're meeting just barely supplying the demand for the managed um, colonies of honeybees that are needed for almonds each year. Um, my understanding is they're looking to create more plants that are not pollinator dependent. And that's the way things are going just because um, they'd rather not rely on us. Um, we are an e enormous cost and some of these, but you know, that's 15, 20 years in the making. These almond trees don't uh, happen overnight. They take a long time to mature. So they're not going to just rip something out that's working and replace it and start over with something that doesn't need to be pollinated. But uh, soybean, soybean used to be pollinated by honeybees. And now um, it's not, it's nothing. It's a desert for them. Um, so you're going to see a bigger push for that. Um, corn, the protein levels in that, it, it does nothing. It does nothing. And, um, you know, there's, it's just corn everywhere. Um, so you might have a little bit of wild forage, but you might have just deserts of food deserts uh, of, of corn being planted. Um, so it has to grow. We're kind of right where the supply meets the demand when it comes to commercial. What we have seen is a huge uptick in, over the last 10 years of backyard beekeepers. Um, but that ebbs and flows and people get into it for two years and get out. Um, but um, it's better than people not participating, a thousand percent. And 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 even if you're interested in bees and have a backyard, you can be a lazy beekeeper and just keep it out there and not manage it. Just you, you know. can run it and see what happens. Yeah. Uh, you know, I always say uh, to be a honeybee steward is to is to plant lavender, is to plant something uh, for the bees in a, a time of uh, dearth. Uh, when, when there's, you know, late July and August in Maryland, when it's just so dry, watch the bumbles and everything come to that lavender. It's crazy. Well, this has been a fascinating look at a, at a, at a part of our agriculture and a part of our uh, culture and our livelihood that, that is kind of hidden from us. We get our food and we don't realize everything that goes into getting that food. Uh, right to us yeah right well i've been uh i'm happy to share all this information with everyone i hope you got something out of it and uh if we were if we were in person it'd probably go for another two hours and i would slow down but i i have so much i'd love to to touch on but um i hope you got at least a glimpse into it yeah everybody's uh chatting thank you and Meredith's going to go buy a lavender plant and so I think we're we're going to be good bee stewards and every time exactly. we eat a berry or an almond we're going to think of you Nathan all right fantastic <laughs> and the bees and the, and bees. the bees and the bees all right I hope um everybody learn something your brain certainly look bigger from this point of view and I hope that you'll be able to join us um again next week and I, I my brain is not working right now i can't remember what exactly it is next week um sure it's fascinating but it, i'm sure it is so thank you so much nathan everybody stay safe um and we'll see you soon okay take care thank, thank you, you.